I remember when this is, was happening, and in DAOs you probably get a lot of, you, you, you guys all know um, if you're a part of a DAO, sometimes there's conflicts, sometimes there's egos, uh, sometimes it's fun and games, sometimes it's silence. But um, anyway, I'm gonna hand it over to, to, to Josh, so take it away, Josh. Thank you, Kelly. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming this afternoon and hearing me talk about DAO collaboration. My name's Josh Foreman, and I've been involved, actually, same organization that uh, Danielle, who was just up here, Shapeshift. I've been there for a couple years, and as she mentioned, we just transitioned to a DAO last year. So I'm gonna provide some case studies, some unique scenarios from when Shapeshift was a centralized company to when Shapeshift as a decentralized company. And I'm hoping that through these examples that you're gonna see that the collaborative power of individuals as equals is one of the things that sets DAOs apart from traditional companies. I think there's many things that sets DAOs apart from traditional companies, but I think this is a very significant factor, especially as we look at the societal impacts and basically just how organizations do work together. Okay, so the collaborative power of individuals as equals sets DAOs apart. Key phrase here is collaborative power. And I'm gonna bring in a working assumption, and that is that if you wanna see how power flows in an organization, you must follow the money. So if you disagree with this, happy to talk about that as another time, but going forward, to see the, how power works in an organization, you gotta see how, how money is controlled. So that being the case, let's follow the money, shall we? And let's start with a centralized company. How does money flow in a centralized company? So first, there is a bank account. That's right, for all of you using crypto, that evil, terrible financial instrument called a bank account. They're pretty much necessary for a centralized company. And there's a board of directors and a CEO and an organization underneath them. And, <clears throat> excuse me, come budget cycle, the CEO, and if they're good and it's a good culture in the company, he, he's gonna, or they are going to put together a budget, submit that up to the board of directors, which will allow money to then flow down through the organization, company budget, department budget, team budget, salaries, expenses, et cetera, to keep the organization going. So let's compare that now to a decentralized organization. No bank account. For those of you in crypto, you can rejoice. There is a Dow Treasury, hooray. And how does money come out of the Dow Treasury? So for a fully decentralized organization, and there's a couple variations here, there is a, a bunch of governance token holders in the Dow, and a token holder then submits a proposal to spend funds from the Treasury. And there's some kind of governance process where this proposal ultimately goes to vote where every token holder that's a part of the DAO can say whether they want those funds to be spent in the way dictated by the proposal. So everyone votes. That's a key differentiator between a centralized company. And also, any token holder can put together a proposal and send that to vote. So again here on your left, Power and money flows from the top down through the hierarchy. And in a decentralized organization, it goes around creating what I think of as a circle of equals. All right, so let's get into some of these specific case studies that I was talking about. So first, let's look at the software development life cycle of centralized Shapeshift. Why are we looking at the software development life cycle? Well, for the few years before Shapeshift decentralized, I was the director of engineering. And uh, so our engineering team had a couple key responsibilities in the organization. One was to do the technical design of our product, which here's a screenshot of what our product looked like as a centralized organization. Great product, this is a web. We also had a web version. And uh, so we designed this. We wrote the code that built this and ran this. We did some initial testing, 
and we maintained it in production, and we fixed bugs when they occurred. All of this happened within our centralized company, Shapeshift. So what happened for a couple times in these years uh, leading up to our decentralization is that the CEO and others in upper management, I'll put in air quotes, decided that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a key, the last key thing that uh, engineering did is we provided estimated dates of when features would be complete. Hey, let's build this, we would go back, do some design, and then come back to the company and say, all right, we're gonna have this done by X date. So sometimes the CEO or others in executive management would decide that we needed a date sooner than that. That could be driven by an external factor such as a conference or a press release or something like that. And then engineering, further down in the hierarchy, would then go back. There'd be a lot of mixed emotions, consternation. How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna do this? And uh, we would talk to the product team. What kind of features can we cut so that we can hit this date? We'd have internal conversations. Can we cut any architectural corners, make this maybe not as good as we would have liked, but we can still get those features in? We would look at what kind of, can we cut quality? A lot of the times in a situation like this, engineers will talk about getting, not writing tests, right? So it won't be as robust, it won't be as, as solid, but heck, we'll still get those features in. Uh, can we work late to get this? All kinds of questions about how can we do this? And there, yeah, there'd be a lot of, discussion, is it worth it? To hit this date, is it worth the corners that we need to cut? Is it worth our future growth, right? For any of these cutting corners, we incur tech, technical debt, tech debt, evil word if you're an engineer, you hate that stuff, but it, 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 it grows when you cut corners. Is it worth it, is it worth it? No matter what engineering thought, what happened is no matter what engineering thought, we ultimately resigned ourselves to hit these dates that came from above the organization. Why is that? What I would propose is that no one in engineering felt empowered to say no to those above us. Now, in full transparency, that does include me. As the most senior ranking engineer in the company, I did not feel empowered to say no. And what I'm neither did anybody else. And what I'm here to propose is that this is not a problem of a specific person's problem. You know, you could say, well, hey, Josh, you're just not a good enough leader. You know, well, that may be, that may not be, but my, what I'm proposing here is this is not a specific person problem. This is a human systems problem. And I've been leading engineering teams for 15 years now. I've talked to lots of head of engineers. I've talked to a lot of CEOs, chief product officers, all kinds. This was not a unique challenge inside of centralized Shapeshift. Further evidence that this is a human systems problem. And if this is a human systems problem, then that means it needs a human systems solution. So let's talk about the software development lifecycle at decentralized Shapeshift, Shapeshift DAO. Here's our new V2 platform product, totally awesome, beautiful, elegant product. We can talk more about that in a bit. But for purposes of this conversation, we are now in a decentralized organization. And I'm gonna relate to you a series of events that occurred in just October, November last year, right as we were transitioning into this DAO method of working. So what happened is that a, call it an influential token holder, they were the CEO of Centralized Shapeshift, they decided that they were going to offer a bounty to be able to hit a certain feature set within a certain time frame. So engineering, even though we're, we're in a totally different structure, uh, Danielle mentioned about like there's still structure in a DAO. So we still had an engineering team as a DAO. We were together as an engineering team. And I was the, now at this point, I'm now the engineering work stream leader, no longer the director of engineering. So here's engineering. We get this bounty and we take it back and we go through the same discussions that we had before, right? To be clear, this is the 
exact same individuals that were in the centralized company. Same senior engineers, me, uh, maybe we had a few less on the engineering team at this point, but it's, this, it's the same people here. And uh, we discussed, is it worth it? Is it worth the corners that we need to cut? And we thought, no, it's not worth the corners that we need to cut. Previously, as a centralized org, we would have resigned ourselves to doing it anyway. This time, because we're in a circle of equals, we actually said no. We actually said no. And what happened as a result of that is that the, this uh, individual came back with another offer, a counter offer that had an extended time frame based on our feedback. We said, here's what, no, thank you, but no thank you. But here's what we can do because we do see the need to get something out sooner. And this individual the token holder came back with another proposal for a reduced feature set, a longer period of time to get it done. And then we went back again and talked as an engineering team and decided this was worthy to do. And we therefore did that. So let's look at this again here. On your left is the centralized company with power flowing down through the organization. And one of the things that resulted when we were in this centralized structure Right, the, the product, after we, had dis after we had resigned ourselves to cutting corners multiple times, the product itself was, um, even though it was, a it was a good product to be able to interact on the blockchain with, it still, it had, it had quality issues. It got more and more complex over time. So when there were bugs, they were harder to track down. We went through periods of sometimes like multiple weeks of performance issues, like what is going on with this product because it had grown in complexity so much, it got so much harder to understand what was going on with it. And it also was a, uh, a terrible developer experience, very hard to work in, took a long time to build new features and bringing a new developer into it was a real, it was a real pain in the ass, frankly. So on a right, now that we are in this circle of equals and we are really looking at the engineering quality that we're building, our product is very elegant. It uh, runs well. It's very lightweight, very performant, can be run in a decentralized manager, a decentralized manner, along with the ethos of our organization. And we also are now able to offer it open source, so we know very well that new contributors come in really quickly get spun up and are able to add features and functionality, so much so that in January, we had more external contributors contribute to the code base than we have members on the core dev team. And that's a pretty significant improvement there. We're <laughs> Something that we're really proud of is the community that's being built around our code base would not have been possible at all under decentralized shapeshift. Under, sorry, centralized shapeshift would not have been possible. Okay, so I'm hoping that after all of this, you've, you've been able to see, as I am, that it is the collaborative power of individuals as equals is what sets a significant aspect that sets DAOs apart from traditional companies. So where do we go from here? Right, I, I've hopefully given you some anecdotal evidence. If you're not here with me right now on this statement, I hope that you're thinking about it and maybe you'll look for some, your own direct experiential evidence towards this. If this inspires you at all to learn more about DAOs to find out if this is true, that's awesome. Um, what I would like to see is any kind of empirical study with quantitative data about this statement to see if it's true or not. Uh, I'm not a researcher, so I don't know how to conduct those kind of studies. If anybody knows of any of those, I'd love to hear about them. And if there's anybody that hears this that wants to collaborate on doing some study like that, please reach out to me and let me know. I think that DAOs are here to change the world. I think they can take this on a much larger scale, and I'd love to get some evidence now to see if this is true or not, and pivot if we need to pivot. 
So I'll get to questions in a minute. Well, I'm actually not sure if I'll have time for questions, but um, maybe. But for now, on, the, on your left here, that's app.shapeshift.com. That's our awesome new product. It is a platform that you can go to and connect multiple wallets to interface with multiple DeFi protocols across multiple chains. That's a lot of multiples, but we are going to the multiverse. So we want to be there with you when you do. On the right is a, a link that's me. I'm actually stepping down as the workstream leader at Shapeshift DAO, staying on as an advisor and a coach, also now on the Treasury Management Diversification Committee that Danielle mentioned, and uh, am launching my own coaching practice. It's been a side business of mine for a while. So if you follow that QR code, you can see a blog post that I wrote that goes into this case study into much more detail. There's also a way to book 15 minutes with me if you want to talk about DAOs. I want DAOs to succeed. I want to figure out what we need to do to keep this thing forward. I really think that we're here to stay and make the world a better place. And if I can help you make the world a better place, I'd love to do it. Thank you.